Okay. Good morning. Actually, I've been waiting for students to join. I see that there are only about uh, 35 students. I'm not sure what is the reason for the other students uh, not joining us. If we'll get started, uh, it's likely that uh, we'll close the course uh, today. Okay. <clears throat> so let us get started. Uh, are there any uh, questions or information that you need before we get started? Okay, we'll possibly close this session by 12 o'clock in case we are about to complete the uh, uh, discussion. So please uh, stay in the uh, session. Okay. Okay, so in the last few classes, we are uh, discussing about uh, you know uh, <clears throat> how to design the processors uh, for which the throughput uh, uh, can be high. Okay, so we've seen uh, three different methods of uh, uh, execution of the instructions. Right, one is the sequential execution, where uh, <clears throat> the current instruction will be completed uh, before the next instructions uh, processing gets started. But that is the naive and the simplest way of doing it and uh, the throughput is not uh, very high in that case right and uh, most of the current day processors uh, know they use a lot of uh, techniques uh, to exploit what is called the parallelism at the instruction level to come up with the process for which the throughput is much higher and uh, one of the first uh, principles to exploit the parallelism is uh, this overlapped execution of the instructions uh, which is referred to as the pipeline uh, processor. So we've seen how the pipelining helps uh, uh, know, to improve the throughput. In an ideal case, one can uh, uh, aim for a uh, throughput of one instruction per clock cycle, but this is only under the ideal conditions. And we've seen the kind of uh, uh, assumptions that uh, need to be made to uh, uh, realize these ideal conditions. And in many of the cases, these ideal conditions are not uh, going to be true and they lead to the different types of what are called the hazards in the pipeline. Uh, there are structural hazards <clears throat> due to the multi-cycle operations in the instruction fetch stage or in the perform operation stage, and the data hazards due to the dependencies among the instructions, data dependencies among the instructions, and the presence of the control, hazard, uh, control instructions like the jump instructions and call instructions uh, can lead to what are called the control hazards. And there are many solutions uh, that are uh, uh, used to uh, minimize the effect of these hazards. We can't completely avoid them, right? And to only reduce the uh, uh, effect of these hazards, right? That's what will be discussed in the next level course, right? And in the process, we've seen that the arithmetic and logic unit need not be a single uh, uh, stage. It can also be pipeline so that uh, one can improve the throughput uh, in the uh, pipeline uh, arithmetic and logic unit. And at the end of the last class, we are talking about processors with several such uh, pipelines, which are called the multiple parallel pipelines. And uh, each of these pipelines will have all the stages that we have seen in the uh, pipeline uh, structure, right? So that multiple instructions can be parallelly executed in parallel, assuming that there are no dependencies among these uh, instructions. And uh, if there are K parallel pipelines, uh, one can target the throughput of K instructions per clock cycle. And many of the current day processors do support this kind of a design, right? And these processors are what are called the super scalar processors. What I've given you is some naive way of uh, scheduling the instructions on these multiple pipelines, but uh, much more sophisticated uh, methods for uh, scheduling the instructions of pipelines. That is, which instruction needs to be executed by which pipeline uh, will be decided by uh, what is called the scheduling uh, method in the processor, right? And that will make sure that the uh, utilization of the pipelines in the processor is kind of uh, optimized, okay? And uh, typically, uh, many of the current day processors, uh, right, support uh, uh, pipelines about four to five uh, parallel pipelines. And therefore, the 
target throughput, throughput can be five instructions per clock cycle uh, in the ideal conditions, but it will be below that. And when you're talking about processor clock rates of above one gigahertz or so, so we are talking about uh, four to five uh, <clears throat> billions of instructions per second being uh, executed. That is the kind of throughput we are uh, talking about. Okay. So this is what we are referring to by what is called the instructional level parallelism. And there's nothing the programmer needs to do. Uh, the uh, internal architecture of the processor is such a way that, right, the everything is done automatically without the intervention of the programmer, right? Programmer will write the programs in the normal way. And the processor architecture will exploit whatever is the parallelism that's present in the uh, uh, instructions uh, uh, <clears throat> that are obtained by compiling the uh, given program and then tries to maximize the usage of the uh, uh, components of the architecture in the process. Okay. Then the, I'll just leave a couple of other words uh, <coughs> referring to higher level parallelism. Okay. One is what is called the thread level parallelism a programmer uh, when uh, uh, writes the program the programmer can identify the different parts of the program which are referred to as the threads in the program which can be simultaneously or parallelly executed then the uh, instructions in the multiple threads of the same program will be scheduled for the execution in the multiple pipelines that are present in the uh, processor in an efficient way okay and that's what is referred to as the thread level parallelism and typically many of the applications that we use on the current day systems typically have this kind of a thing done where different parts in the program which can be parallel executed will be identified and uh, each of these uh, uh, parts is what is called a thread and the processors will try to execute the instructions from the multiple threads simultaneously in the uh, a parallel pipelines that are available in the uh, process. The other one is what is called the application level parallelism. Which are typically done on what are called the multi-core CPUs. So what are the superscalar processes that we talked about will be the logic that's available in what is called a one core of the processor. Then uh, typically nowadays, the current day processors have several such cores. So each core is capable of performing this execution in the multiple pipelines within the core. And there are typically anywhere from two to eight or even more number of cores in the processor. It all depends on how many transistors can be put in the processor and uh, the different uh, 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 <clears throat> manufacturers of these processors like Intel and so on, they do uh, have these CPUs with multiple cores uh, for the processors that they uh, manufacture. Like you have the i7 processor with uh, four cores or six cores or eight cores, right? What does that uh, mean? Basically, each core can be used to execute one different program or a different application. So if I have four core processor, then four different applications can be simultaneously executed uh, in the processor. So each process, each application will be executed on one core within the CPU. And typically, all these cores will have their own ALUs, their own uh, cache memories. And only thing is the main memory will be kind of shared by the uh, multiple cores, right? So this is the highest level parallelism uh, uh, that can be uh, 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 used at the uh, in within the system, right? And again, the programmer does not uh, have to do anything, right? We just only initiate the execution of the uh, multiple programs, and each program that's initiated will be called as a, an application, and these applications will be run on the different uh, uh, cores within the CPU. Okay, so obviously the presence of uh, multiple cores within the CPU will lead to larger throughput of the CPU, right? Let's say if I have four cores and each core is capable of doing 5 billion instructions per second uh, throughput, right? 
then we have totally 20 billion instructions per second being the throughput of the overall cp okay so but there are a few issues about the uh, sharing of the uh, physical memory among these uh, multiple cores in the cpu that again will be discussed in the end of the uh, next course on the computer organization architecture okay <clears throat> yeah any questions up to this point again i'm just leaving only the few words uh, no few terminology right uh, just to uh, introduce them right but uh, uh, all the principles of uh, 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 these techniques will be discussed in the next level uh, course okay yeah any any questions about this what we have discussed uh, so far okay so what we are going to quickly discuss in the remaining part of the course is the role of what is called the operating system within the computer system all right uh, again it's very brief because you are going to have one full fledged course uh, later in your uh, fifth semester as uh, you people might have kind of read you no know, the operating system is nothing but mainly what is called a resource manager typically any computer system will have an operating system as all of you are familiar with uh, you know many of the systems that we use have the windows operating system apple has got a different kind of an operating system right so the different uh, uh, types of computers may have different uh, operating system and each of these operating systems has the main functionality of what is called the uh, resource manager and what are the different resources in the computer system that we are referring to here we are talking about typically one or more cpus within the processor i mean within the computer system right and then the another main resource is what is called the main memory in the system okay and then the peripheral devices right it can be a hard disk or it can be a keyboard or it can be a display right all these are peripheral devices right and, and typically a computer system can have one or more of each of these uh, peripheral uh, devices right and <clears throat> the question is when you want to use this computer system with a certain number of cpus and some amount of main memory some number of peripheral devices right how do you manage this uh, different resources to meet the demands of the users right and uh, typically <clears throat> most of the computer systems that we use nowadays you no know, they have the operating system with which do what is called <clears throat> multi programming right what do you mean by this term called multi programming operating system we are referring to the operating system that uh, will uh, handle multiple applications or the more appropriate term which will introduce quickly is called the process <coughs> simultaneously again we need to understand the term called the simultaneously here right and so typically the operating systems that we use in the, many of these systems uh, even a simple desktop that you may be using or a laptop that you may be using right is based on what is called this multi programming operating system mainly because typically even if there is a single user in the system the single user may want to run different applications simultaneously right but if there is only one cpu and if there is a limited amount of main memory and there is a only limited number of peripheral devices right how do we <coughs> allocate these resources to the different applications or what are called the processes and it should it has to be done in a efficient manner and it has to be done in a fair manner to the different programs that need to be executed so now we introduce this term called the process a process is nothing but a program in execution all right so basically if you start the running of a program right then that will be called as a process right and typically we initiate the running of program for several applications 
right? And therefore, there are multiple processes that are being uh, there uh, in the system that are active within the computer system, right? And typically, each of these processes will be associated with, like, because process is nothing but a program that's being executed, right? The program will have the code, right? <clears throat> which corresponds to the program that's written in the higher level language typically, and then that has been converted into the binary form. So we are talking about the binary uh, uh, representation of the program, which is also called the executable code of the program, right? Or machine code of the program. So the code will be one part of the process, right? And the variables that are used in the program, right, are referred to as the data part of the process, which is called the data segment. And that can be another segment like a stack segment where <coughs> all the entities that are put on stack will be uh, uh, <coughs> dealt with, right? So typically any process will have this code segment and data segment and the stack segment, right? Now let's just uh, look at the case where there are multiple processes and uh, let me just indicate them by process P1, process P2, and so on. Let's say there are K processes <clears throat> that are to be executed simultaneously. When I say simultaneously, it's not that there are multiple CPUs. There can be a single CPU, right? But I want to get started with each of these processes and then execute them. And we want to execute them in a manner where the throughput for collectively for all these processes put together will be as high as possible. That is, I want to take minimum amount of time to complete the execution of these processes in the computer system, right? So the first question that will be asked is, when I have only one CPU, how do I manage these multiple processes with, uh, with only one CPU? That's what is referred to as the process scheduling. The process scheduling part of the operating system takes care of assigning the CPU to a process. One of the simplest ways of process scheduling, again, you'll be studying about the uh, uh, different uh, uh, <coughs> methods, is what is called the round robin scheduling. where there is a quantum of time typically of the order of a few milliseconds let's say it's a uh, 5 milliseconds so each process will be <clears throat> executed for 5 milliseconds then that process basically the cpu will be allocated to that process and once it uh, completes its quantum of time then that process will, the CPU will be taken out from that process. Then the next process we want to execute will be uh, given that CPU. Then this will continue in a round robin fashion, right? Let's say if there are uh, 10 processes, right? Then each process will take uh, five milliseconds. Then after 50 milliseconds, then again, the first process will get its done, right? And uh, please remember that we are talking about the CPU, which can uh, uh, have a throughput of a few billions of uh, instructions per second so five milliseconds is a quite a uh, long period where you can execute some millions of uh, instructions right and that that will uh, be helpful to uh, do quite a bit of work within the particular application or a process right and typically you will have not uh, uh, the standard arithmetic and logic instructions right or the load and store instructions typically there can be many uh, input and output uh, statements within the high level language program, which deals with the file operations or the uh, display uh, operations or getting the data from the keyboard, which are all kind of slow operations. And whenever uh, these slow operations are involved, there's nothing the uh, ALU in the CPU needs to do, right? So whenever those conditions arise, then the process uh, will be taken away from the, or the CPU will be taken away from that process, right? And then it will perform these necessary, uh, what are called the input and output operations. So typically, 
the process <coughs> will be in one of the states within the uh, uh, operating system, right? I, I'll just give the simple uh, process state diagram uh, indicating what are the different uh, uh, states, right? Whenever the process is ready to execute, then it will go to what is called the ready state. And whenever the CPU is allocated to that process, then it will go to the running state. All right? And then whenever the process has to do some IO operations like the file IO or the screen IO, uh, screen output or the keyboard input, right? Then it will be suspended because the CPU is not required for that. And whenever the, now when the process gets executed, uh, gets started initially, it will go to the ready state. And whenever the CPU can be assigned to that process, it will go to the running state. And after the executing a few instructions in the program, if it involves some input and output operations, right, then it will go to the suspended state. And once it uh, completes the IO operations, right, then it will go back to the uh, ready state. And typically there can be many processes that are in the ready state and they'll be put in a queue in a particular order. And the process at the head of the queue will be given the CPU, then that will go to the running state. And even if a particular process does not have the IO operations, right, once it finishes the quantum of time, right, then that process will go back to the ready queue, right? Uh, so that the other process will take uh, the CPU and then execute the instructions in that process, right? So all this uh, CPU scheduling for the multiple processes that are being handled by the operating system will be taken care of by the scheduling method, right? Our scheduling algorithm. And the scheduling algorithm is part of the operating system. And the operating system uh, will make sure that every process will get some quantum of time to execute the part of the uh, process, right? And therefore, depending on the number of processes that's present, the time taken to complete the execution of each program can be different at different points of time. At one point of time, if you're running only five processes, then a particular process may complete within some time. And the same process, when it's uh, uh, being executed some other time where there are 10 processes that are being simultaneously executed, right? Then it may take more time, right? So it all depends on how many processes are being uh, simultaneously executed at a, uh, a particular point of time that uh, indicates or that determines the time taken to complete the execution of a particular process. So this is about the CPU scheduling, right? Which is referred to as process scheduling or the CPU schedule. Then the second most important functionality of the operating system is what is called the memory management. And here we are referring to the management of the physical memory in the system. And uh, typically the amount of physical memory that's available in the system will be kind of uh, uh, limited, right? And uh, many of the current day processors, I'm talking about the simple uh, desktops, right? It can be anywhere 1 GB to 4 GB. Some of the uh, uh, <coughs> higher end systems may have uh, more than uh, this, right? Let's uh, uh, limit our discussion to the uh, systems where the physical memory is typically from 1 GB to 4 GB, right? But this is the physical memory. What do we mean by the physical memory? This is the main memory that's available in the system. Which is also what is called the RAM, which actually should be called as the DRAM memory that's available in the memory system or in the computer system. And typically whenever you want to execute the program, right, the complete program needs to be brought into the main memory, then we start the execution of the instructions of the program by fetching each of the instructions from the main memory and then perform the necessary operations as per the procedure that we have seen, all right? But now let's uh, 
think about what happens when i'm talking about a multi programming operating system i have multiple processes and what is the size of each process here it depends on what is the size of the code segment and the data segment and also how much of stack uh, space is required in order to execute the program and that is actually difficult to determine let us just focus on what is called the code segment and the data segment how the stack segment is handled uh, will be uh, discussed later in the uh, operating systems course for you okay so now let's just focus on the code segment and the data segment so the size of the process is typically dependent on the size of the code segment of the process and the size of the data segment data segment of the process right what is the size of the code segment dependent on it depends on the number of machine level instructions that are uh, <coughs> uh obtain uh, by translating the high level language program right let's say if there are 10000 instructions if uh, each instruction takes four bytes right then the size of the code segment is going to be 40000 bytes right and many of the programs that we write are typically much larger right so they may take a few megabytes of uh, uh space to just store the code segment and what is the data segment that we are talking about the amount of memory that's required for each of the variables that you have declared in the program right and depending on the type of the variables right like it's if it's an integer type variable or floating type variable certain number of bytes are required to store the data of each of these types of variables and you may have data structures like the arrays then the linked lists uh, structs and so on right and each of them will require certain size of the space in the memory right in order to store the data of that elements of the data structure right so collectively the space taken by the instructions and the space taken by the different variables and the data structures in the program will determine what is the size of the code segment and the size of the data segment both of them added together will determine what is the size of the process right and uh, typically in the simple way of the execution of the process one has to bring the complete process into the main memory and then start the execution of the program so that every instruction that i need to fetch will be available in the main memory and every variable data that i need will also be available in the main memory and we can get the instruction or the data from the main memory and then do the processing and then store the result back in the main memory right but now imagine what can be the size of the process in the maximum let's say we are talking about execution of only one process in the computer system right what can be the maximum size of the process now that's going to be limited to the size of the physical memory that's present in the system right and that's a serious restriction because many of our, uh, our applications can have the process size larger than the size of the physical memory that's present in the program i mean uh, present in the system right and now think about what needs to be done if i have to execute multiple processes simultaneously let's say i have the process p1 which uh, takes uh, 2 gb of process space right and process 2 requires 1 gb then process 3 requires again 2 gb right process 4 requires 1.5 gb right and collectively all this uh, put together is larger than the physical memory that is going to be there in the system it all depends on how many applications you want to run simultaneously and what is the size of the process for each of these applications and if the collective size of all these applications put together is larger than the physical memory that is available in the system then using this mechanism we cannot execute so many processes right which require such a large space in the memory all right and if you think about a little bit right there is no need to bring the complete process into the main memory and then start the execution right actually this is one of the important uh, concepts that has been introduced in the uh, 70s right what is referred to as the virtual memory concept according to which we don't have to bring every process completely into the main memory before we start the execution right we do what is called the main principle of this virtual memory con concept is that we'll bring part of the process into the main memory only when that part of the process is 
required in the execution of the program okay and typically the part of the process that's uh, brought into the main memory is referred to as a page and uh, the typical size of this page can vary from one operating system to another operating system but uh, many operating systems use what is called a page size of 4 kilobytes or 8 kilobytes so what is done in this uh, demand fetching principle of the virtual memory concept implementation is that the whole process will be divided into pages and depending on size of the process i may have a number of pages in the process let's say my process size is only 40 kilobytes right then there will be sorry 10 pages in that process right because each page is 4 kilobytes right so then there is a process with only 10 pages if my process size is let's say 80 kilobytes then there will be 20 pages in the process right so now we, let's say the code segment starts at the beginning of this process and after we execute a few instructions in this page then we may have a jump instruction or a call instruction to some instruction in page 2 uh, right so now when we are executing page 0 we don't require the other pages right let's assume that uh, the first few pages are all code uh, uh, pages right where the instructions are available right then we don't require all the pages that contain the code we may require maybe initially page 0 and if there is a call or a jump to some instruction uh, in, in page 2 then we may need uh, page 2 then after we complete the uh, execution of function we may go back to page 0 then continue then we may come to page 1 so only uh, some pages may be required to be brought to the main memory when they they need to be uh, executed and the reference to the data in the execution of the instructions will be referring to some other pages of the process where the data will be stored right and again depending on which data is being processed by the current part of the program we need to bring in only those pages into the main memory right so then the basic question arises where is the process initially available the process the machine code is available in a hard disk right and that's what is loosely referred to as the virtual memory and we bring part of this process from the secondary storage device like a hard disk into the physical memory that's the main memory or the ram whenever that is required that's why it's called the demand fetching and specifically this is referred to as the demand page okay so what is uh, done in this uh, demand page now every process when it starts executing will bring a few pages of that process maybe the first uh, page where the code is present and the first page where the data is present right and then we start the execution and after that only whenever the remaining parts of the process are required those pages will be brought from the secondary storage device into the main memory now you can see that this enables uh, the operating system to execute several processes irrespective of what their page, uh, process sizes are, right? Even if their collective process, process sizes put together is, less, is greater than, much greater than 4 GB, still I can simultaneously execute all these processes because we don't bring all the code segment and the data segment of each and every process into the main memory then the main memory is of fixed size right though then we need to bring uh, these uh, pages of the process into the main memory and now the main memory will also be kind of partitioned into parts right and the size of the partition will be same as the size of the process then each part of this main memory is referred to as a page frame right so the first part is called the page frame 0 the second part is called the page frame 1 right let's say if my <coughs> memory capacity main memory is 4 gb right then if my page size is 4 kilobytes 
right then there are one m pages right so the number of page frames sorry num- uh, there will be one m page frames right so the number of page frames will be from page frame 0 to the millionth uh, page frame right that's what will be available in the main memory then each page here will be each page of the process will be stored somewhere in the main memory depending on which part of the main memory is available so page 0 may be stored here and uh, page 2 may be stored in some other page frame right and now the pages of the different processes can also be present in the main memory simultaneously right and what we are seeing is that <clears throat> there should be somebody who takes care of this allocation of the page frames in the main memory to the different page of each of the process and again that's what is done by the operating system especially the main memory uh, sorry memory management part module of the operating system will take care of uh, managing this main memory that is allocation of the page frames in the main memory to each of the uh, processes that are currently being executed then where to store this information all right because for the operating system to access the <clears throat> relevant parts of the process right the information about where the different pages of the particular process are available in the uh, main memory that information should be available right so now we introduce what is called a page table where the page table will have the information about the page frame number in the main memory which has been allocated to the page of a process so there will be page table for every process right and whenever a process is being executed the page table will be created then for every page in the process there will be an entry in this page table let's say if i am talked about uh, the process with 10 pages there will be 10 entries what we present uh, in this page table for every page let's say for page 0 we'll have the corresponding page frame number let's say if it is a uh, page frame 20 right then here that information will be available so this is 20 if this is available at uh, page frame 35 right then the so this is 0 then this is 1 this is 2 right so then this is page frame 35 right so basically the entries in this page table will be filled by the operating system whenever the pages are allocated to the corresponding page frames in the main memory now when do i access this uh, page table so typically what is generated by the compiler now is referred to as not the address in the main memory right it is referred to as the virtual address or what is called the logical address because at the time of the compilation it's not possible to know where the process is going to be placed in the main memory so at the time of the <coughs> compilation every instruction and every variable in the program will be assigned what is called a logical address starting from zero right every instruction will have Uh, an address and every variable in the program will also have an address this is what is called the logical address and this logical address will be converted to the physical address during the execution of the program and the logical address can be represented in two parts one is the page number then the other part is the offset let's say if i'm talking about the page size of four kilobytes right and if we assume that every variable and every instruction is of four bytes right then there are 1k instructions or 1k variable uh, entities right so what we refer to as logical addresses which page of the process that particular instruction or the variable is <coughs> there present right and then within that page what is the offset from the beginning of the page 
right so the page number and the offset put together will give the logical address that will be assigned to every instruction or a variable during the compilation and during the execution of the program this page number will be used by the operating system to access the corresponding entry in the page table where the page frame number of this page table will be available so that page frame number will be taken out from the page table and this page frame number along with this offset will give what's called the physical address that is the address in the main memory so this physical address in the main memory is what is sent as address to the main memory unit like what you have seen earlier in the course right where i send this as the address right then we perform either the read or write operation right and if it's a read operation we'll get the data from the main memory and if it's a write operation we'll give the data then that will be returned to the main memory. okay so typically this is the process <clears throat> which needs to be carried out whenever we are talking about execution of a program so every instruction fetch will involve this translation of the physical address sorry virtual address to the physical address and then access in the main memory. now there is going to be a question right whether it will not increase the time taken to perform the fetching of this instruction or the data because where is this page table going to be stored page table will also be stored in the main memory all right and one has to access the main memory in order to get this page frame number and once we get the page frame number then we have to access the main memory to get the instruction or the data from that main memory so that can lead to more time being taken to perform the <coughs> instruction fetch or the data operand fetch right again there are solutions to this right so typically any processor will maintain what is called again i'm just leaving the term which is called the translation look aside buffer where whenever a process is being executed then for that process the content of this tlb will have the different pieces of information related to that process where we store the recently accessed <clears throat> page numbers and their corresponding page frame numbers this is available within the cpu it's a small size memory like a cache memory right uh, which will be fast access memory right where the recently accessed pages and the corresponding page frame numbers that information will be stored in this <coughs> page frame i mean the, in this uh, uh, tlb so the address translation where i have the virtual address and that contains the page number and the offset so this page number will be given as input to this tlb and then it will search for an entry where the page number field in that entry matches with the page number of the virtual address that needs to be translated and once it matches we get the corresponding page frame number and that page frame number will be taken out and then along with that we take this offset information to get the physical address and now we can avoid access the page table for every <coughs> memory reference right and <coughs> many times there will be an entry that's available in the tlb so that we can get the page frame number from the tlb itself and because this is a fast uh, memory right the time taken for this will be different and only when it's not there in the tlb then it will go and get the uh, information from the page table right so the time taken to perform this translation will be reduced significantly by using this uh, translation look aside buffer so basically what i wanted to just understand is that this enables significantly to deal with processes 
where each process can be larger than the size of the physical memory or the collective size of all the processes that you want to execute put together is larger than the 4 gigabytes or the physical memory space of the processor okay and most of the all the current day systems do make use of this virtual memory concept and then perform this demand uh, paging right in order to support the multi programming execution of the uh, multiple applications uh, in a given system with uh, even a single cpu and a, with a finite amount of memory okay because without that it is not possible to run the processes which are larger than the uh, size of the physical memory or run multiple applications uh, simultaneously where their collective size is larger than the size of the main memory that's available okay so again i'm just uh, giving you some brief uh, outline of the method that's typically used in the implementation of the virtual memory concept there are lots of details that uh, one need to uh, look into uh, right and that's what will be discussed in the some part in the next level course computer organization and architecture and few parts will be uh, discussed in the uh, operating systems course uh, for you okay any questions okay if there are no questions i think with that we come to the end of the discussion on this and also the end of uh, uh, course right there is only one topic uh, which i am not covering that's uh, mainly the virtual uh, machine and that requires uh, uh, quite a bit of time maybe it requires a, a couple of weeks uh, time right and we don't have that and that will be again discussed in the compiler's course uh, at a later point uh, for you in detail okay so what we are trying to discuss in this course foundations of computer system design is uh, to learn about how the data gets represented then how the data gets processed different types of data different uh, types of circuits required to process the data that was the bulk of the uh, uh, <coughs> topics in the course right then at a uh, later point in the course we started looking at how we represent the instructions how the different uh, statements in the higher level language programs get represented in the machine level instructions then we spend some time to understand how these machine level uh, uh, representations the binary representations of the machine level instructions get uh, uh, kind of processed that is what is it involved in the execution of the uh, instructions in the uh, cp right so with that uh, <clears throat> it gives a kind of a, a insight into what is it involved in designing the computer system mainly the design of, uh, of the uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> most important part in the computer that's the cpu and within the cpu the most important component uh, is the arithmetic and logic unit that's what we have designed uh, and uh, discussed and the other components like uh, the main memory and uh, then the uh, control unit that will be discussed in the next whole course then the, there are many other courses where the remaining topics like the compilers design and then the operating system design all right so these topics will be discussed in the subsequent courses for you in the next semester and the uh, following uh, semester okay uh, as the name itself implies this is a kind of a foundation course where we lay the foundations for many topics that you are going to uh, study in the uh, next few semesters okay yeah any any questions or comments okay logistics nothing much uh, so there will be a tut tutorial uh, 3 on uh, this Thursday between 12 and 12.50. Uh, that will be on the topics like uh, sequential circuits and the generation and the execution of the machine code, which has been mainly covered in the last uh, few weeks. Then the assignment 4 will be on the next Thursday, again between 12 and 12.50. Uh, that is a kind of a makeup tutorial. And uh, the syllabus for the tutorial 4 will be all the topics that are covered in the course. Okay then uh, there is no indication about the end semester examination for this course yet uh, we'll uh, let you know as and when uh, the uh, decisions are made about that but the indications of that is likely to be in the end of november okay and there will be at least uh, two weeks uh, uh, notice given to the students uh, about the end semester exam if it's going to be conducted at the tcs uh, uh, centers okay so please wait for the information about that to be uh, available okay 
then uh, the assignments uh, four five six in the lab course are being evaluated so mostly we'll uh, release the results uh, uh, of that sometime uh, uh, next week right and assignment seven uh, which you have submitted already and assignment eight that will be submitting next week they will be evaluated by me okay and i will look at uh, both the uh, uh, assignments that you are going to submit assignment seven and eight and then uh, give the marks for that and as i said assignment eight will have more weightage than the other uh, assignments okay so the completion of the evaluations of all these assignments may take some time so only by end of uh, november i would expect the marks for all the assignments to be uh, available okay uh, yeah any any other clarifications or questions Any next semester classes? Next semester classes uh, are likely to start in January, mostly January 16th or so. But the mode is not yet decided. Uh, we'll review the situation in the month of uh, uh, December and then take a call on that. Okay. If the situation does not become normal, all right then uh, we may have to go ahead with the online teaching if uh, it's possible for the students to come back to the campus then we will have the regular uh, uh, classes okay yeah okay any other questions okay good it was nice to have all of you in the course here unfortunately we did not have a visual contact all right hopefully some other time later <laughs> maybe in some other course i'll get to see you physically right and all the best with the with this course as well as the rest of your the btech program or the dual degree program in the institute thank you okay If there are no other questions, then I think we'll close the session now.